Good evening, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, children of all ages. This is your co-host, Peter Strappen of Northwest Marine Trade Association slash Seattle Boat Show, where we are coming to you live from our headquarters in beautiful Seattle, Washington. And there's my co-host, Mark Bunzel. Good evening, Mark. Hello, Peter. And we're live here from the uh, world headquarters of the Wagner Cruising Guide in Anacortes, uh, Washington, overlooking the beautiful Guimas Channel. Oh, so, beautiful. Uh, beautiful corner of the you. world. Yeah. And there's there, the Landon's is coming on. Uh, they're also, uh, they're broadcasting in Anacortes, Washington also. Good evening, all. Yeah, it's episode 32 for us. We've got a big week, big show in store. It's uh, what I'd like to call the Seattle Boat Show Eve week. So we've got everything in preparation. All, all good stuff is packed up and ready to roll as we launch virtually. We're calling it Seattle Boat Show Connected. Start online, end up on the water. We can talk a little, little bit about that in a in a few moments, but um, yeah, happy National Hugging Day, Mark. National Hugging Day, I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, let's Am keep I you separated. Doing? Was there a preparation? I... <laughs> it's a little dated, I, I, I can tell you. It's a little dated of a holiday, so yeah. Okay. Well, what's going on in your world, Mark? Did you get on the water this week? No, but the Landons did. They were out on the water, I believe, today. Exactly. That's part <laughs> of our update. Fun things like uh, going to the pump out, going to get fuel, uh, testing out some equipment, tootling you're getting, around. You're and getting then, ready to cruise. You're uh, you're yeah. you're going to have the boat packed and ready to go north. Uh, hopefully that border will open up. We're we're <laughs> optimistic. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Well, excellent, well, excellent. I'm preparing. I'm going for my vaccination next Wednesday, so I'll see the rest of you in line. And uh, uh, anybody who's planning on going north, if you can get in that line for that vaccination, do it. I, I don't know whether it's gonna make a difference, but uh, I don't think it's gonna hurt. It might hurt me, but... Uh, and uh, I, I have a special announcement. Uh, I'm gonna catch one of our guests, our, our uh, co-host. Uh, and uh, Lorena, uh, I, I think tomorrow is a, a special day. It's probably not polite to mention a woman's birthday, but tomorrow is <laughs> Lorena's birthday. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> yes. Oh, wow. Yes. Nice. It's a big one. It ends in zero. Oh, I have, no. to, I had I no have to admit, it's not 50, it's not 60. Uh, we'll just leave it there. <laughs> but yes. No. You're still voting. You're doing great. You uh -huh. look great. So enjoy tomorrow. I'm sure Leonard has all kinds of wonderful things planned. Oh, yes. Exactly. Yeah, we try to keep in shape, do hiking, and I have to be able to leap around on the boat, you know, so we keep in shape. No, <laughs> she, we have to explain how, when she says leap around on the boat, we were out with some, uh, with some of our family members about two or three weeks ago, and we were coming back into our marina on an ebb current, and the ebb current puts, uh, makes the entrance to the, uh, to the marina a little difficult, and so I asked Lorena to take one of the ball fenders and uh, and be on the ready just in case. And uh, the, the the current shifted around a bit. She was on the foredeck, and uh, she amazed the rest of our family by leaping over the Portuguese bridge uh, area and leaping uh, with the ball fender in hand. And everybody was just, I don't believe that. <laughs> Grandma is doing that. Boat, you know. <laughs> That's fantastic. So what do we have for updates? What's going on in the Puget Sound area? Oh, a couple things. Do you want to start first? Mother? So uh, one was the, uh, the the sunken vessel that we mentioned right here in Guaymas Channel, right next to Anchor Cove and the uh, Guaymas Island Ferry Dock. That thing made the uh, local notice to mariners. The U.S. Coast Guard registered that as a hazard to navigation. And uh, we were out there today, and there's actually a, a, a vessel out there. They're, they're working on it. Uh, don't know if they're trying to refloat it or not, but there's somebody out there working on it. Um, the other one, uh, so we did go over, with, besides doing the pump out and the fuel, we were over to PMC to get a little bit of boat work done. Asked them a little bit about how the, what their schedule looks like, and uh, their, the answer from Todd over there was, get your, uh, your, your work scheduled now. Uh, he's anticipating that if and when any, any uh, positive indications come about the border or even any kind of cruising this summer, with the increased number of boats out there and the boaters, uh, he's just expecting it's gonna be packed. So he said, get your, get your work orders in now uh, instead of later. 
Um, and then a reminder that if, you know, with uh, last season, with uh, a number of boats that may not have been out, they were idle or don't, they weren't out as often or as much as a, in a normal season, it's just a reason to get out there and, and uh, get an early start on this. Uh, Todd even mentioned he has a, a boat that he, uh, that he takes things off of regular, regularly for the off season. And uh, it's things like putting all of the life jackets back in the boat. And uh, this season is gonna be a little bit more challenging with that if you haven't used the boat last year. So get an early start on that. Um, and then uh, the, uh, another one was interesting. We were gonna get some uh, Isenglass work done and uh, there's a shortage of Isenglass right now. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, the canvas people can't get it. Uh, and it might be a result of all of the uh, plexiglass stuff that, uh, that's been going on for COVID. So again, get an early start because there's some shortages that we may not know about yet. Lorena? Uh, some news from BC, the province of British Columbia, along with the BC Marine Parks Prayer River Society, a nonprofit. They recently uh, just closed on the purchase of an island in the Octopus Islands. It's just uh, uh, at the eastern edge of Wyatt Bay. And the island is fairly good size. It's about 49 acres. So we can look forward as boaters to visiting a new island, new destination. There will be some steps first before they can open it to the public mapping and consulting with uh, local governments and developing a management plan for what kinds of uh, activities or designated uses uh, for this island. But that sounds pretty exciting. And uh, of course, this uh, Marine Parks Forever Society was also instrumental in installing the uh, stern ties that we all love in the BC Marine Parks. And then, the, of course, the counterpart is ARBA, Marine Parks Conservancy. And they're going moving forward with the purchase of Lake Bay. Sounds very promising, but uh, they encourage people to please still send in your, your donations for this project and other projects in, in the future. <laughs> Great. And uh, Peter, you've got some news from the legislator. This legislative session going on in Olympia, very exciting time of year. What's going on? Thanks for asking, Mark. Yeah, so the session started January 11th. It's a long session, a 105 day session, and the, uh, some of the products will be the operating capital and transportation budget. And we've got a couple bills that we're watching, and not, not just watching, but actually supporting one of them, which has to do with that skipper chartered vacationing issue we've talked about in past episodes. So that has a hearing next Monday in the House Transportation Committee. So that is some breaking news there. Uh, all the bills start with an idea and our idea has got a little bit of momentum right now. So feeling really feeling really good right there. And then on the other side of that coin, I testified against uh, requiring mandatory boater education for all kayakers and canoers and stand up paddle boarders. Wow. That had a he hearing this week that, that was a, a pretty sweeping bill where you would have to pass the course, pass the exam. And then also it would take away the grandfathering that exists for people born between before 1955. You'd have to go through the mandatory boater education course. So the legislature's paying attention to boating safety as we are. And uh, I was, I, I, it's one of those issues I hate to be on the, perceived as being on the wrong side of boating safety. So I was measured in my remarks, but I, we just, right at this point, the way the bill's written, it seems awfully sweeping. So we like to see more. Well, I would say so, but knowing how the test questions are, uh, they're more geared towards power boats. To put that across on human powered craft seems to be a little bit extreme. Yeah, so that's that was the sentiment of, as you can imagine, of the people testifying, a lot of passionate kayakers who did not feel like they wanted to sit through an eight hour exam to get in their kayak, so. But uh, it's a long legislative session, so we shall see. I'll keep you all posted. You've got to stay tuned at home now, and we'll see how that, those bills turn out. So that's my update. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Appreciate that. Uh, Leonard, Lorena, anything else in your department? Not right now. Okay. Let's keep rolling. And uh, Peter, uh, I understand there's a boat show starting, there's I think it's... What, a week from now? You've seen the tens of thousands of ads that are now <laughs> peppered throughout the the media. Mark, I believe you're starring in one of the commercials. I've uh, heard that as a yeah. rumor, and I, I haven't it's seen off. it yet. So I don't believe it yet, but I'm told that uh, the Wagner logo is very visible in that, that commercial, and I guess they caught me 
teaching a seminar. So yeah, lecturing. So yeah, anything um, for the cross. We appreciate the man for others, Mark Bunzel. So yeah, we're yeah. we're all geared up. We've got Katie McPhail waiting in the wings this evening. She's always there. She is. Hi, Katie. Hi guys. Thanks for letting me on stage tonight. Yeah, you're always dying to get on there. And <laughs> finally, a dream come true here. So Katie and I work together all year round. Katie's the Seattle Boat Show director and knows much more of the details than I do. I will say I was out today filming all day today. We we were we started at 9 a.m. at the Fairmont Olympic Hotel to talk about how to make the perfect cup of tea on a boat. And then we drove over to Mischief Distillery in Fremont and talked about spirits and the perfect cocktail and how to pair food and cocktails. Tough, tough duty, Peter. And I know, thank you. It was a hard knock live, I think, uh, as Charles Dickens said. Um, so, and then we weren't done yet, Mark. We took a, a tour of a, of a one of the more famous floating homes um, on Lake Union, uh, Mike Sherlock's home right below the Aurora Bridge, which has about 5,000 square feet. So we got a tour of that on video for the Seattle Boat Show Connected. It's, it's for sale, Mark. We got to let Grossbeck Realty Group know about that one. I won't ask I got the, the price. If I, I can't got the plug it, in there. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, but and then we went over to Diane Lander, longtime friend of the show. She had us on her Lake Union Dreamboat, the Marion 2. And we talked about having your pet on board. We talked about all the organizations she's involved with. And we talked about how to stay organized on, on your boat. And then I just whisked right in here, Mark, and got to see your shiny face. So. Wow, you have had a busy day. <laughs> yeah, I, I parked my broomstick in the corner and away I'm, I'm here. Um, and so, yeah, Katie, what's going on at the Seattle Boat Show Connected from your desk? Yeah, well, in addition to everything Peter just named, we've got another 100 hours of really exciting boater content. Um, so we've been working hard on that. Everything fishing, boating, cruising. Um, Mark will be in there with this Boat Show University program. Um, so a lot of really good content. Um, we also have over 209 exhibitors signed up for the show. So if you're looking to um, buy a new boat or outfit the boat that you have or get information about any products or services, um, all of that will be there just like it is at the in-person show. Um, and you've got an option. You can either shop kind of in a, a web 2D dimension or you can check out our 3D virtual show floor. Um, so you'll actually be able to walk the red aisle carpet virtually. And I'll go ahead and try to share a little sneak preview of what that'll look like. I'm really looking forward to this. This sounds so cool. I haven't, wow. Can you guys see it? Have you guys seen this, Mark? You haven't seen this? No, I haven't seen oh, this. Oh, surprise. <laughs> so, so this is just a sneak peek of what it'll look like. Um, it's a rendition of kind of the West Hall. And as you can see, there's red aisle carpet, just like you'd see at the, um, the in-person show. And all of our exhibitors, all 209 exhibitors have created a um, kind of a trifold 3D display. So you can really, in the same way um, that you would explore the show in person, you can do it here virtually, which is always nice to stumble across something um, that you haven't seen before. But even uh, more exciting than that, you don't even have to walk anywhere. This will be your chance to try out teleportation for the first time. Um, so using our filter system, if you're interested in shopping for a particular boat or product, um, you can filter and head right over to the booth that you're interested in um, through teleportation. That's and we'll, also, we'll have some fun uh, promotions happening on the show floor as well. So you can take part in our, uh, our virtual treasure hunt. Um, so as you're walking, you'll keep an eye out for treasure chests that have a whole host of different prizes, some monetary, some coupons, um, all sorts of stuff. So be sure to check that out. And, um, and Katie, the uh, people can walk that now, can't they? Right now, if you want to register, um, go to the site, you can see a demo. Um, but it actually, this, this one's in the works now. So this, this version's more impressive and more interactive and it'll have all the bells and whistles added in on the 28th. And I understand there's five levels of tickets. Do you want to explain that? Yeah, so there's four levels of tickets. The first uh, level of registration is $5. So if you want to get in um, and see all of the content as it's being broadcast, that's the, the entry level ticket and it's $5 per household. Um, so anybody that fits on your couch is welcome to come. Um, then you can upgrade to our, our $20 sailor package. Um, you can watch those seminars as they're broadcast, or you can go back and rewatch them. So if you see something you like, you can watch it twice. Or if you miss something that you really wanted to see, you can go back and watch it. Um, at the captain level, 
That includes access to the Boat Show University classes. That's again, as they air. And you can upgrade it to our Admiral level for $89. And that would be all the content as it's being aired and also um, in the rewatch format. And that also includes some extra goodies, um, long list of goodies here. I'm gonna use my cheat sheet. We've got a one year subscription to C Magazine. We've got a basic membership to Boat US and we've got a Wagoner cruising guide and a ticket to the 2022 Seattle Boat Show. So a lot of extra goodies packaged into that uh, higher end ticket as well. And I'll just add, uh, I've been staying on top of the ticket sales and uh, $89 is a, a chunk. And there are people who love that because they're able to take advantage of all the 15 Boat Show University classes that are normally about $40 each. And uh, it, that's the second most popular ticket, I'm told, that people yeah. are buying. So uh, we're going to be busy giving those Seattle Boat Show University seminars as well as those other goodies. Yeah, I think people are really seeing the value there. So um, yeah, head over to seattleboatshow.com to register. Um, you can do that now and even start pre-shopping the show and start perusing the seminars. You can add them to your calendar, really kind of create your own agenda for uh, what you want to do during those four days of the show. Katie, do you want to talk about the various activities that are also going to be going on? Yeah, let me see if I can pull up that page of the website. And I'll just mention that you can watch me for free, Mark, the entire course of the show, 34 hours. Denise Whitaker and I will be hosting the, starting that Thursday at four o'clock in the afternoon and then come back Friday, hopefully, if they'll have me, and Saturday and Sunday. So I'll have about 80 different guests on experts of a variety of different fields, and that, that's all available free at seattleboatshow.com. And I understand it's not just boating. You're going to have wine tasting and all kinds of things. It is everything. Cooking. Yep. Ethan Stoll and I, uh, as you know, yep, that I saw those that 22 minute uh, food commercial yesterday that he and I did. It was fantastic. Look at John Grace Wayne in our chat. How cool! I bought the $89 ticket and I'm still saving over $500 from driving over and staying a couple nights in Seattle. That is very exciting. And John's banging on the door there, Mark. He wants someone to get the new guide. Oh, okay. Well, we can we can we can certainly ship one out as. Uh, Love it. Go on the Wagner Guide website and order one. It'll be on its way. So those hey, are the are activities, guys, Katie? Yeah, are you yeah, guys able to see my screen? Great. We are, yeah. yeah. So, so these are um, just a few of the things that are coming up. As I mentioned, the virtual treasure hunt, um, kind of cool way to win fun prizes and further explore the virtual show floor. We're continuing our dogs on deck promotion that we started last year. So if you got... Um, a doggy that loves to get out on the water, uh, participate in that photo contest so you can win a $500 prize package. Um, we're also doing a virtual yearbook courtesy of Boston Boat Boatlifts. Um, everyone knows 2020 was kind of a rough year, but it was great for boating. So if you were able to get out on the water, um, send us a photo of your favorite boating memory from 2020. Um, we're gonna be doing a really cool photo booth as well. We'll have a, a virtual pirate ship that you can explore. Um, and the, the photo booth in, in includes some ways to get goofy, um, but also to uh, have some fun with your family there. And then, um, Peter, you started to mention the Boater's Kitchen. That's on there as well. And uh, we're making some changes to the Build Your Own Boat deal, but that'll be updated shortly. So, um, and just tune back in because we'll be, we'll be adding to this as, as we get closer into next week as well. What I like too about this is different is the favorites part where you can curate, you can cruise the show and just favorite uh, different boats and accessories that you've never been able to do before. So that's a nice way to keep track of everything that you like. Katie, can you talk about specific numbers? How many exhibitors, how many boats, how many photos yeah, so, uploaded? It's mind boggling. Sure, we have uh, 209 exhibitors already and a few more that are joining us, I think tomorrow or early next week. Um, we've got 550 boats on display right now, 320 products and services. Um, We've got all the exhibitors set up with scheduling and chat. So if you're there and you want to talk to an expert, ask a question. Um, we've got a lot of really cool 3D Matterport tours. So you can actually, in some cases, go into the exhibitor's uh, showroom or into a boat and tour the boat. Um, and there's just a ton to see. So if you've, if you've got questions, if you want to learn something, if you're shopping, uh, it's the place to be January 28th through the 31st. Fantastic. I, I know what I'll be doing for four days. Sounds like fun. All right. 
We thanks, are. Guys. Yeah, thanks, Katie. Thanks, Katie. Good to see you. Bye. Katie also pushes the buttons and dials behind makes, us. So. Makes us look she, good, Mark. That's that's does. right. She does. Yes. So thank you, Katie. Uh, we've got a great show lined up for you tonight. Kind of a really interesting, you know, people, some people say boating's expensive. And I heard about this creative idea from uh, Jake. Come on. There he is. Uh, Jake Beatty. And Jake is the executive director of the Northwest Maritime Center in Port Townsend one of the most enthusiastic supporters of boating in the area. And uh, not only does he talk about it and promote it, but he goes out and does these crazy things in boating. And I, I will give credit where credit is due. Many of you have heard about the race to Alaska. And uh, I have to say, I, I would call Jake the co-inventor of the race to Alaska along with a few other people. And uh, Jake, Tell us about the Northwest Maritime Center before we get into our travel topic tonight and uh, the Washington 360. Yeah, sure. So uh, thanks for having me, first of all, uh, especially in the, the, I guess it's your week eve before the big boat show. So best of luck for that also. Um, so the North, for those of you tuning in who don't know the Northwest Maritime Center, we are a regionally serving nonprofit that works more out of our kind of home base up in Port Townsend. And we do a bunch of different stuff, most of which you've probably heard of, but you might not know is connected to us. So we started with the Port Townsend Wooden Boat Festival 43 festivals ago, back in 1977. And since then, we've created a campus. We work with schools. We work with adult education. We have a simulator. We do docking practice. We do radar classes. We uh, put on the race to Alaska. We've created a human-powered race called the 7048. Our newest race, called Washington 360, is essentially our consolation prize for everyone who wanted to do the race to Alaska, but the borders we're imagining is still gonna be closed. Sorry, everyone who, if I, that's a spoiler. It's not a, it's a preemptive spoiler. It's a possible spoiler. Um, so we're worried about that in June. So we created a race that basically is a Port Townsend to Port Townsend race uh, via Olympia and Point Roberts. So it's 360 miles of engineless self-supported racing in the spirit of the race to Alaska that we're kicking off this year as well. Um, the other way that you might notice is from 48 North Magazine. That's part of the, the Maritime Center's family of programs. And our newest project for all of you in the Seattle area, you might have been reading about this in the Seattle Times. Um, we're the program nonprofit in support of the new Maritime High School that Seattle is going to be home of pretty soon uh, through the Highline School District, kind of like Aviation High School, but uh, of the sea. And we're working with them to start that project inaugural class come this September, actually. So lots going on and has nothing to do with what I'm about to talk to you about. <laughs> well, and, and uh, you know, I obviously Jake has a dream job. I, I, I think he just gets to play with boats and boating programs and kids and adults all day long. But Jake really intrigued me a couple of years ago. We invited him to speak in Anacortes and I thought he was going to come talk about the Maritime Center. And he showed up with this phenomenal presentation about a style of boating that he does and he does as his vacation and he's done a couple of these and I thought he'd share it with you. And you may have seen the description, you know, just a little bit of a teaser. And Jake, I'm gonna let you describe it. Tell us how this all started. Where did you get this brainstorm? Yeah, well, um necessity is the mother of all inventions what they say i also think being broke is the mother of all inventions so um this here i'm gonna just share my screen and start the uh start the presentation here so th the title of this presentation is 600 bucks five weeks and a floating lawnmower um and the guy who chatted in earlier about you thinking i was going to be here to talk about an alternative to chartering i mean that is broadly what this is but um i don't think if you're thinking about is the you can't charter a $600 boat that I know of anyway. Um, so this was born from, uh, I mean, the other, the alternate title of this presentation is um, Lessons I Should Have Already Learned, uh, which is uh, the, the calamity of this. Any, any good vacation for me is sort of the sea story. And I'm basically an outward bound instructor that kind of grew up. And so I've spent my twenties doing sail training and education, often on long boats and sort of the sail out of Anacortes and teaching young people how to make themselves better through hard experiences on the sea. 
And it was, I was uh, in my 20s. I just got married. I guess it was early 30s. I just got married. I was working at the Center for Wooden Boats as the deputy director there. And uh, my wife and I, who was also a kind of a weirdo boat person, um, decided that we wanted to finally do our honeymoon. And so from a seasonal nonprofit boat employee, so you can't go in the summer because that's a busy season. You can't do anything expensive because you're a nonprofit employee. We thought of like, where would we go? If we were going to splurge, where would we go? And we quickly came to the Philippines because I don't know, when I was a kid, I had a map of the Philippines at the foot of my bed and I would just look at them and just like be fascinated. I was always fascinated. I grew up in Bellingham, archipelagos and islands. It was just like, that's what intrigued me. And so, I mean, look at that. It's, there's 6,000 islands in the Philippines. It's, um, it's incredible. And there's, in, in, in terms of like tropical places, there's not a ton of poisonous things. Um, and the other sort of low barrier entry is like, the other official language is English. So in terms of barrier to entry, pretty small. So uh, I started thinking about how would I do it? And like, you, you could buy a boat here and sail, go cruising. That's kind of the standard way, like buy a boat and sail around the ocean. But we didn't have that much time. We had like a month and a half. Um, so I got this idea, which was like, I don't know, I'm going to go on a Craigslist in Manila and see if they have a boat section, um, which they did, which leads me to lesson number one, which is something you all know already, which is you don't buy boats over the internet. Um, that's just not something you should do. And the reason is because why this is what I fell in love with. This was a $600 boat. Uh, it's called a Banca. You might notice it is a... Uh, a sophisticated inboard. It doesn't have a sort of outboard strapped on. This is an integral propulsion engine. Um, and if you're wondering, it is a lawnmower engine. It's the big boy. It's the colder, it's 10 horsepower, single cylinder, uh, dry exhaust. You can see the exhaust, it's just right there. Um, not as simple as that, but for, for whatever reason, like this is it. This is exactly what I want to do for six weeks. And uh, God bless her, Jean said yes. Um, so the, the style of boat, if I can take a little side, um, the style of boat is called the Banco, which is a typical Filipino boat. And they come in all different shapes and sizes. They have Bancas that are sort of, this is fishing Bancas without motors. They've got tiny ones that people pull and they can throw, you throw nets off of. There are larger ones that use as charter boats, but all kind of the same design. Each region of the Philippines kind of has their own design to them. Um, each region also they identify is like the license plate is actually the paint job so you know where the boat's from from how what color it's painted and they also have really big ones so they can get like this one's like 65 feet long and it's this narrow hull with these mm, call them stabilizers not really a lot of flotation but sort of they're just bundled bamboo on on the edge so i contacted this person in the philippines who was selling their boat and we bought it, and then we bought tickets, and then we went. Um, so Philippines, again, there's, there's 6,000 islands. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a country that has got a lot of cultures through it. Like uh, it's been colonized in, uh, by the Arabics, uh, the Arabic people, um, Spanish, Portuguese, Japanese, Americans, and sort of it's, so it's this cultural suit that is interesting, super friendly people, really poor. It's a very poor country. Um, but we flew in, we bought tickets and we flew in and we went from the airport to these jeepneys, which are fan, they're like old army jeeps that they keep alive and they just keep, I don't know, they keep them alive by adding chrome. It seems like every year they add more chrome to these 60 year old trucks. Then we jumped from a jeepney to a trike as we got from like big city to smaller city. And you might notice there's a lot of stuff. Um, because one of the things you do when you buy a boat for $600 sight on seat in a third world country, um, you bring a lot, like you bring a customs frustrating amount of stuff. Like you bring two part epoxy and goo, because you don't know what you're going to get. You bring flares, you bring crazy poisonous things from the tropics guy because you have no idea what you're getting into. So we, we basically brought the, the mash unit shipyard in a, in a, in a series of duffel bags, um, some stuff we knew we were going to need, some stuff we didn't know, but we just brought it. Uh, and, Jake, did you uh, did you catch any fish that you threw back? I see that fish you can eat, fish you can't. Did you not eat every fish that you caught? Oh, uh, we only caught one fish. I'm going to say that, and we'll get to that. I actually have a picture of it. It's 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 memorable. I'll say that <laughs> very memorable. <laughs> so we brought a ton of stuff. 
And we ended up in this um, like kind of a slum on the, on the, I mean, uh, they, were, they were fishermen. They just had their huts right on the beach. They had their boats in front of their, their huts. And this was our boat. And you can see there's not much boat there. It is uh, about 18 feet long. It's about 18 to 24 inches wide at the widest part. Um, sorry, of the hull, the actual, you know, the katigs or the, the amas, if you want to call them, as we know, they're, they're about, it's almost a square boat. It's about 18 by 18 if you take overall dimensions. Um, and the construction was like bizarre. And that the bottom, like the keel was essentially a dugout, but only up about three inches. And then they had notched in some places for the ribs to go. And then you just nailed an epoxy, like just poured epoxy all over the place um, to make it watertight ish. So Jake was six hundred dollars um, a good deal. I mean, sure. What what kind of a boat can you buy for six hundred dollars? I mean, this is fantastic. What are you talking about? It's great. I wouldn't know. I haven't been to the Philippines. It looks beautiful. I like I like the paint job. Oh, thank you. You know, as I, like any new boat owner, like when you get and you see a bunch of projects, you just paint it because you just need to do something to feel like you're doing something that's visible, right? So we painted it. Uh, but with the help of it, we actually spent a long time on the beach sort of working on it. Here is, here is the pride and joy of the boat though. This is a unleaded gas. Um, there is no transition. So you start it and you're moving. You just, there's no reverse. So it's learning how to anchor and like learning how to come into docks is like, you got to nail it because it might take you a few, you see, you have to wrap them. You have to wrap the string and the handle and pull it. Um, uh, it's also the throttle was what I found fascinating. So it was, you can see it here. There's the, the carburetor and then the throttle arm has some monofilament line that goes back to a little nail that was bent in the gunnel and back to a piece of foam that it was round, wound around. And if you wanted to accelerate, you just rolled the foam forward. And if you wanted to slow down, you rolled the foam back. And it was just, the, it was just nailed into the gunnel with a nail. And I remember one time, like I was just traveling early on. I was trying to like figure out like why isn't the engine why is it losing speed and it was I realized that the nail had come loose so it wasn't holding tension anymore so I just had to nail it back into the gunnel and then it, it could it, we we could maintain idle <laughs> really low tech also yeah. there's no there's no exhaust system other than this straight pipe that points right back at whoever is in the stern so you're sitting there and just um, the best piece of equipment that we bought, we, the best, I mean, we made a lot of improvements. We'll get to that a little bit. The best improvement we made was when we bought cotton and we just shoved it in our ear so we wouldn't we hear it. Um, at one point we're going through and Jean's like, it doesn't feel like nature. She's yelling over the roar of this unmuffled. I'm like, what? She's like, nature. Anyway, that's, that's the I, I need to add a little footnote. Uh, Jake and Jean are still married. And they did do another trip after this. So Jean's, Jean's a trooper. She is a trooper. Yeah, it was, it was, I mean, we should have done this as not a honeymoon. We should have done this as a vetting process for <laughs> marriage. I agree. And so we spent about, I think about a week working on the boat in different ways. So we painted it, we relashed everything. Um, and there was always like these, it was, this, it was like, it was like a Peace Corps, like a, a recreational Peace Corps experience. Cause there's always just like this entire village and the guys would be in the back passing judgment and then helping out and the passing judgment and helping out. And the kids would just be running around the whole time. It was super fun. Uh, it was also a really interesting way. I mean, one of the things I really enjoy about this kind of, and we've done a couple of trips like this where you have a boat that you can't exist outside of the culture, like in more, most cruising, you have your boat and it's full of stuff and you can hang out on your boat. We were camping on, like there's, there was no way for us to not have a cultural experience because um, we were just on the beach with all these people all the time. Um, so we got everything together and uh, our plan was to leave really early in the morning because that's when the weather was the best. And uh, this was us just before we left uh, on our first trip. Which brings us to the second lesson we should have all already learned. You should not decide what you want to do based on what you want to do. You should base it on like what the conditions tell you. Um, and so to give you some context about this, we were going from this uh, Labak Cavite, which is right here. This is Corregidor. Uh, this is where the, this over here was sort of the, um, the Bataan Death March was over here. They still do it as a recreational fitness run these days, it turns out. Um, more people survived this time. 
Uh, so we had to get from uh, Labak to Manila, and um, the weather here did not cooperate. And so what we ended up doing is leaving the afternoon after the wind was building. And this is kind of what was happening. So imagine that 18 foot boat overloaded with all that stuff we brought, trying to like jam ahead into a uh, heavy chop. We flooded the boat, the contacts got wet and we ended up, luckily the wind was going our direction. So we ended up drifting right back to the same beach and people there like, they were like, hey, I thought you left. And then they came down and they like pulled the entire village, like pulled the boat out uh, and then helped us. We got new amas and we added freeboard and we did a bunch of other stuff. And we hired some village people who finally would let us pay them. Uh, anyway, so then we finally left. Um, How long did it take you left. To, prepare, to prepare the boat, Jake? Uh, well, which time? <laughs> I'd say the first time was uh, about three days. The second time we had about three days, but we like the village took pity on us essentially. And we ended up hiring them to, to do a bunch of stuff. So it went a lot faster. Jake, can you go back to that previous slide? I love that guy's smile, just laughing, having a great old time helping you. <laughs> I mean, we were, we were weirdos. Like we were like, I don't think white people hadn't showed up in this village ever. I don't know. They thought it was weird. We were taking, buying a boat to begin with. They were pretty happy because um, they were fishermen, the fish were kind of dying. So they were trying to find anyone who would buy their boat. Um, and like no one, no one takes one of these boats to go any, there's no recreational boating that happens. It's all work boats. So you go out and you fish, you come back, you go out and you fish. We actually had to get a letter from the mayor of this little prefecture to give us permission to do this weird thing. And they had to figure out what, yeah, we had to hire a lawyer. It was weird. <laughs> we had to hire a lawyer. Yeah, so there was a lot of amusement at white people who were just doing the dumbest thing everyone thought. Uh, so we ended up leaving very early in the morning. We left at 3.30. The village came out, including like the 75-year-old grandma to help us launch the boat at 3.30 in the morning. Um, and then we went to Manila. And Manila is a town of like 16 million people with no sewer system. So uh, th this was a great trip. This was not the great trip. This is when we crossed the green line from like water to water and it smelled, um, and we had to go to Manila, oh, wrong way. And this is also our uh, harbor approach was this, so this crazy poverty slums, shanty towns, uh, kind of built on the breakwater out of just anything. Um, the reason we were going to Manila we, is, was that we didn't want to go to Manila. What we wanted to do was go to this region on this uh, western side of the Sulu Sea. It's a part of the uh, Philippines called Palawan, which is a UN natural heritage site it's got a thousand islands. It's got 5% of the population. So it's pretty, it's pretty pristine and rural compared to the rest. Um, and we didn't know our boat very well, but we knew that an 18 foot open canoe probably shouldn't do this crossing here. Uh, so we went and we found a ferry that would take it. And this is when I Google the ferry after we took it, like the next week or so, well, it was six months, it was six months later. Um, it was just, it was a bad scene. We probably, if we would have done our research, we probably wouldn't have gone, but we didn't, so it was fine. Um, it was, there's some sketchy boats in the Philippines and once in a while you read about them catching on fire. Well, one we were on caught on fire about six months later. So we got to the harbor. Uh, we had to give it to some porter people who had to dis partially disassemble the boat. There wasn't like a boat launch. There, there was just rip rap and these guys um, that we like hired the whole gang. Uh, they took it out of the water. We put it on this sketchy wooden ferry. Uh, and then 36 hours later, uh, some of the weirdest food I've ever eaten on board a boat. Uh, they, we were loading it in Caron, which is a town at sort of the north end of the Palawan group with these guys who are way less sketchy. They all match hats. And then 15 minutes later, this is what we were doing. And this is where like, in terms of like the lovely part of the story, this was the lovely part of the story in that we had a boat and there are no recreational boaters. There's just a few people who use boats for work. There are some ferries that go between the major towns. But other than that, there's not people anchoring. We saw one Western style boat the entire time we were there in an anchorage. Um, but we would go from amazing limestone karst topography to amazing limestone karst you know, um, topography and geology. We'd go snorkeling all the time. It was, um, phenomenal because there's no one it was just us 
and thousands of islands we're going through. And look, look at the boat traffic. It's crazy. Well, it wasn't actually. We saw a few fisher boats out there, but it, we would just make our way through these islands. Um, this is kind of what our life looked like. Uh, that we we didn't have a real bimini, so we used the rain fly from our tarp when it got really hot out. Because uh, this is like 15 degrees north, so it's pretty pretty tropical. Um, you can see here sort of our very sophisticated fuel system. So this is our day tank. It's a gravity fill filled like two and a half gallon tank. Here's our main fuel tank, which is five gallons. And about every two hours, we'd have to siphon from the main tank into the, uh, which I still have the taste of gasoline in my mouth from that part of the trip. Um, <laughs> we would stop a lot of places and um, the boats lashed together. So the hull itself is um, you know, nail and epoxy. You can see down here, like where the amas or the katu, they call them, lashed the hardware. It's just lashed, so it would loosen up and we brought a bunch of nylon twine, we'd lash it together and we'd go another four hours, we'd stop and tighten it up again because it would shake itself loose. Um, but it was a kind of a fun way, I mean, so the other thing about the, the engine, so it's it's just a straight shaft, it goes to a two-bladed prop and the, sh the shaft log is a piece of copper, like just plumbing that's sort of epoxied and cemented into the, the bottom of the boat. And it was about six feet long, so, it would whip around quite a bit and it would finally whip itself. It was just a little, it was maybe a half inch diameter. Like it was really small. So eventually it would get to the part where like it was so bent, I couldn't, I couldn't straighten it. So I'd, I'd take it off and I, you know, we take it out of the back and I'd, I'd walk into town with this shaft and propeller on my back and find someone who could straighten it. But in a, there is an official language. So English is one of the languages uh, that's official. The other one's Tagalog, which is, kind of like Esperanto of the Philippines, because there's over a hundred individual um, languages that exist. So we would literally go from one island to the next and from one shaft straightening um, experiment, I would, you know, I, I learned that it was called the Pala Pala at that island. But like two islands down, I was like, oh, it's Ben again, I gotta go get it straightened. I'd be like, Pala Pala? And they'd be like, no idea. I'm like, the thing that, you know, I'd like show them, they're like, oh, it's the Ellisi. I was like, right, that's what it's called here. So it was this, again, I dig like hanging, like getting to know the people of a place. And um, it was pretty, it was pretty fantastic a, a way to do it, even though it meant that the boat was just breaking the whole time, but you know, we weren't trying to go very far. Um, and this is how every night we would just beach the boat. There's no anchorages. We didn't even have an anchor, I don't think. <laughs> so we would just pull it up on the beach. Uh, usually you can find something to prop up the back so you weren't on the, on the, on the, the two blade propeller and the, or the uh, rudder, excuse me. Um, so we just pull up wherever and pretty much wherever was pretty welcoming. So people would take us in. These people let us like they were caretakers of some big uh, island reserve and they just let us camp next to their place. They actually gave us breakfast in the morning. The nicest, the nicest people, people who had absolutely nothing, wanted just to be friendly. They weren't trying to like get anything. We would always try to leave something that wasn't insulting just because uh, the wealth gap was so profound. Um, but like, this was just a place we found and just stayed at and we put up a hammock and there wasn't any, we didn't see anybody, we just pulled up. Um, and there's not like camping. So it's not like even, there's not even campgrounds that we could find uh, like we'd normally find in the San Juan's or something. This was a resort that we found that was, hadn't even opened yet, but they put us up because they thought it was fun. Um, you asked about fishing earlier. Uh, this was Jean went fishing with the resort owner and she caught her first fish. You probably can't see it, so I'll zoom in. There, there it is. It was a uh, black grouper. Um, <laughs> it's tiny, it's apparently endangered, so we threw it back. Um, <laughs> fishing in the Philippines, there's a, there's a lot of um, kind of kind of like poor countries everywhere where there are people really starving to survive. Um, there's a the practice of both dynamite fishing and cyanide fishing, where they either like put in explosives into a reef and they set it off to blow up the reef, it stuns the fish, they can grab the fish or they take bottles with the like, cyanide solution, they squirt it into holes, that, same thing, but it kills the coral. And so there's a big effort right now of trying to rebuild that um, because it's just, there's an ecosystem issue there and, and a hunger issue at the same time. Uh, so we threw that one back. I'd love the guy who took her out. Like his face is like, you're, <laughs> you're exactly what I think you are. But Jake, uh, but this is I'm like, wondering, what did you do for food? Did you provision or did you just, live with whatever the local oh there we go there's dinner 
So this was this was uh, at that resort. They were, they were trying out recipes. And they they would go out and catch. This was from like two hours before they caught this fish. So it was yeah you know, pretty fresh. But we'd go from we'd go we'd provision in each town we would go to, and we'd we'd show up at a town and they'd be like, oh that's great, that's pretty. They were like, you're on a what? So we had to go through that like who are you and what are you doing conversation every single time. And then they'd sell us food and then we'd buy gas and then they'd say, well where are you going? We tell them where and then they'd say. Oh, don't go there. Those people are horrible. They'll like rob you and kill you. And we end up going there and then we'd be buying gas and we'd go through the whole story. And they're like, oh, where'd you come from? We like, well, that town. They're like, oh my God, you were lucky to get out of there because they would rob you and kill you in that town. We just found everyone to be super nice the whole time. Uh, the sea story part, I don't know how we're doing on time, Mark. Uh, You're doing great, Jim. Yeah. Great. I get excited. I talk fast. This, this is a, one of the best trips ever for me. <clears throat> one, you know those times where you don't really have a lot of local information. We didn't have any. We had some charts, um, but in this part, there's no VHF. People, there is VHF radios, but no one monitors them. There's no weather service. Um, there's very little cell phone reception. At least there was at the time. Um, so before we left uh, Corona, which is up here, they said like, "Yeah, have fun in this group, but like, don't cross Limbicon Strait." And so all the way down, we were asking people like, don't cross Limbicon Strait. And one of, one of them said, well, here was the boat um, that got wrecked last week in Limbicon Strait. Um, and you can kind of see why, like, so this is the South China Sea, this is the Sulu Sea, and there's a huge current that goes through there. There's pretty big winds. There's a big sea state that comes out of the South China Sea that time of year. Um, and this was, this was uh, like early January, late January, early February. Um, but we got to, one person, one person said, well, um, how big is your boat? And we we're like 18 feet. And they're like, it'll be fine. It'll go up and down between their waves. So um, we went, uh, which brings us to my final lesson of this evening, which is don't cross a perilous ocean strait on an 18 foot canoe held together by string, power light by a lawnmower and of unknown structural integrity, which seems obvious. Um, but uh, I don't know. I've been on a lot of, I, it was, Honestly, this was the first time. So my background's in merchant mariners and sailing and uh, teaching sailing and doing outdoor survival stuff on boats. Um, and looking back, I realized like, this is the first time I was ever in a boat in a perilous situation that I actually didn't trust the boat at all. Um, and the reason we ended up going was because it looks pretty, like if you look at the chart, like what's the big deal? Like there's a five mile hitch and then there's some islands you can duck around and then there's this eight mile hitch here that's, that's 12 miles. It's kind of sketchy, but it's, you know, on a boat that does eight, that's an hour and a half, how bad could it be? Um, I wouldn't say it was terrifying and like waves never photograph well, uh, but this is when we started out in the morning. Pretty good, there's the islands that we were headed towards, those islands in the middle. Um, fast forward until it was about two o'clock. We left at 5 a.m. It was about two o'clock. We were sun stroked. We've all been breathing exhaust. The wind was building. The tide was wrong. There were, I am, and this is this is me being the mariner guy, not the person who's never seen waves before. Like we were in all of 15 foot seas um, that were long and we were in between them, but there were also three wave sets that were coming in at different angles. And so not being a multi-hull guy, I tried going in them on the, on the sort of on the bow and that would torque the boat and it's where I could actually feel, I could watch it twisting in front of me. Um, and I could, the little piece of wood I was sitting on was actually knocking back and forth from side to side. Um, we had a ditch kit ready to go. I was, we were, it seemed like the closer we got to the other shore, it, the rougher it got. And I was going over these waves sideways and we'd flop down and I'd go, try to go from ridge to ridge to ridge as these waves got steeper and closer together. Um, I could see one of the lashings loosening up. Uh, it was it was on on the verge of being a like. I'm I feel very fortunate to be speaking to you today about about this very uh, humbling crossing. Um, that which is a little bit of a spoiler in that we did make it. We made it to the other end of this. This was where it was really like. I was all of a sudden I was I didn't you know we couldn't hear each other over the roar of the motor. We had eye contact with each other. And I just remember like thinking in my head, I was, I was practicing my apologies to her family as we were going across. And, and I just want to remind everybody that this is your honeymoon, correct? Yeah, that's right. It I think the honeymoon, honeymoon maybe had ended at that point, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't get off the boat, so I had that in my favor, right? 
smooth. Yeah, a strategy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we ended up, we, you know, we made it through. We, 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 we relaxed everything just on the other side. We kissed each other. And then we spent like the next three hours surfing down waves into the town of El Nido, which is the next place the ferry goes. And this is the Anchorage and uh, is the UN heritage site. If you don't need to do what we did to get here, I would not actually suggest it. But um, if anyone has a chance to do any boating, even if it's through guided service, this is um, an absolutely breathtaking part of the world. It's an archipelago uh, that is um, protected um, there are this, this is uh, when our camera died. So I had to grab someone else's photo, but there's underwater caves that you can run to. And the tour boats have a very specific, they go to A beach, B beach and C beach on a very um, pretty regimented schedule. But we would be camping on these beaches and then the locals, I mean, the tourists would show up and then we'd have the whole island to ourselves for the rest of the day and night. Um, the only downside was sort of the howler monkeys were loud. Um, and that is cool and annoying all at the same time. Um, and we spent about a week here sailing in and around and camping in, in these beautiful sunsets. And uh, the postscript to this story is that, um, so I had about another week, I had a week on my own. I was going to go just zoom around islands like this by myself. But I, after five weeks, I finally succumbed to sort of the, in, the first world intestine issue that one often gets uh, at, in, when you go traveling in these countries. So I spent three days sort of in a state of disarray, uh, intestinal disarray inside of a hostel. Um, and when I came to, I still had about five days. I had, I had seven days left that I could go zoom around. I went to the travel agency just to see like, well, this ferry. And I looked at them and they looked at me and said, well, um, yes, that's true. But if you're gonna get back to your flight, everything's booked um, except for the flight that leaves in 60 minutes. And so my, this is my, one of my favorite parts of this whole story is that uh, I had been trying to sell the boat before we showed up. I was like, I should put some flyers up. So I put flyers up uh, that roughly like this, uh, that just said like, here's the boat, here's what it did. Um, and I threw in, a, I put, I put free bottle Tandaway rum, which is the local rum. I was like, that comes, that's part of the equipment of the boat. Um, and so in the next hour, I, I, as I was running around collecting my laundry that had been in the laundry place and like trying to pay all my bills and buy a ticket, I, um, I would go to these people who I kind of had some, you know, top, you know, pretty casual friendships with. And I would say like, hey, here's the thing. Um, I got to leave in an hour. I got to sell this boat in an hour. Um, there's this family down the road. I think they'll give me, you know, 300 bucks for it. What, what can you do? And then I started basically started this like foot traffic auction where I'd run and I'd tell them about it. I'd run back and then there's these, and as soon as I tell them, the family's like, They'd, they'd say something in the, the, the local language to the kids and they would scatter and they'd all be trying to like find what, 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 what they could find money-wise to grab up in this auction. So in the, in the, in the hour, it was, it was 90 minutes. It was the 90 minutes between me learning I needed to get on a plane. I created an auction, did a test drive, sold the boat for 300 bucks, a burger, a beer, and a ride to the airport. And I gathered my things. I got a tried ride to the airport and I stepped on the plane and was just laughing because I mean, yes, I lost 300 bucks on a boat, which makes it almost the second most profitable boat I've ever owned. Um, and <laughs> also it just, it was uh, kind of the bluff of the whole thing was like, I was trying to sell it for 300 bucks and I had 90 minutes to do that. The price at 91 minutes went to zero. So I felt like I got a pretty good deal because <laughs> I had to walk away from it regardless. Anyway, uh, that's the abbreviated fun story of my trip to the Philippines, uh, the postscript of this is that six years later, my wife and I bought another boat for $600. This was a Hobie 16 that we bought in Loretto, uh, Baja, and then spent three weeks kind of doing the Sea of Cortez downwind. And in that trip, you were camping on shore and then sailing all day in the Hobie 16, right? Yeah, that's right. Yep. No motor, though. That one didn't have a We learned our lesson on that one. And how much did you sell that boat for at the end of the... 600 bucks. That's the most profitable boat I've ever owned. I bought it for exactly what I sold it for. Three weeks later. Yeah. That's fantastic, Jake. Uh, it, uh, it, it's inspiring. I, I, we're running out of time, but I, I looked on Craigslist today and I, I found a boat down on the Florida Keys that I wanted you to give me a judgment call for $2,200. Uh, I thought the Florida Keys would not be quite as exciting 
as the Philippines. So uh, I, I'm going to do it one of these days, I think. You know what the the for us we actually found our so that was about every six years we do these apparently because next year we found a, we found a charter company for uh, in the Exuma Keys where they actually will rent you an open twenty one foot boat with a sailing rig and some oars so we're gonna go beach camping but we we don't have to buy it and sell it this time. Well, that's quite an improvement and and uh, the Exumas are a little bit more civilized than uh, than the Philippines. Yeah. Well, that's oh, fantastic. Great. So you recommend that uh, that I do this? Well, I don't know what the boat is, but in general, when the question is boat, yes or no, I mean, I trend yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's the experience, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I'll have to I'll have to let you know how it goes. Uh, it'll it's take me be a the greatest years. decision you've made or a great story. Like those are the two options you have, right? Well, that's true. And my sailing partner, I have to sell her on the idea. And uh, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. She's more of a shower and resort kind of person. So uh, it could be a challenge. How about you, Peter? Oh, I don't know about that. It's kind of like, do I want a 25 cent taco? Like, I don't think I do want a 25 cent taco. I think I will. <laughs> as Jake would say, I think I'm going to trend up on that. <laughs> yeah, Peter. Peter's wife is spoiled on the uh, on the Nordhaven. <laughs> I don't blame her. Yeah, That's right there with her. <laughs> Jake, anything to wrap up? Any words of wisdom? Should we all run out and do this? I mean, I would say it is, I mean, I don't think anyone's tempted to do this, to be honest with you. I don't think I have to give any advice. This is a self-selecting servant sort of activity. Um, I find it enjoyable because I think um, what I really value about boating and sort of being on the water is, isn't the easy parts, right? It's the figuring it out. It's being, it's being in, in, in unity with uh, whatever elements are around it, whether it's the boat I'm on, whether it's figuring out the boat I'm on, whether it's the tides and the currents, we do a lot of angelus boating. Um, so it's, um, for me, it's the puzzle and, and, and getting closer to, um, I don't know, pure being rather than comfort. That's, that's just how I roll. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think it's an inspiration to all of us and obviously a, a very different way of boating at very economically. So when people uh, tell me they can't afford to go boating, I'm gonna let them play this video back and let them see a, a different way of going about this. So uh, uh, Landon's, do you have any other comments for? Uh, for uh, well, I think it sounds <laughs> fabulous. The experience of Philippines is, is beautiful. It's, I think, uh, the, the whole idea is it's the experience and the challenge and uh, you have a story to tell when you get back. That's awesome. And then we had our, our story with the uh, with a Craigslist boat that we encountered on the way up to, uh, we were headed to Prince William Sound one year and encountered this boat. That's a, that was a 1978 Marine Trader. And this couple, retired couple had purchased it on Craigslist, sight unseen in Tacoma. And they were taking it back to their hometown in Anchorage, which means taking it across the Gulf of Alaska. And we encountered them partway, about halfway up, and they followed us. We led them as far as Juno because their one set of charts was in a laptop that fell off the console, and uh, they had no charts. And uh, so that, and and the highlight of the trip was in the Wrangell Narrows when their engine, single engine on this, quit, and we towed them through the uh, the Wrangell Narrows, and there we we. We uh, led them all the way to Juneau, but uh, that was our experience with somebody who we learned later on that they bought this sight unseen on uh, off of Craigslist in Tacoma. Spent about a week getting it ready to go and uh, headed up to uh, to their hometown. The, the end of that story was that uh, we kind of threw our questions to them about survival equipment going through off uh, going across the Gulf of Alaska in Juneau. They decided to leave the boat in Juno, and about three weeks later, we came back to the marina, and there was the boat, and there's the for sale sign on the side of the boat. <laughs> yeah, that's, that was the ending. Happy, end of that, that's happy that's ending in that story. Well, Peter, Jake, I can't thank you enough for sharing that. Uh, that's a, a fantastic story, and I know we've uh, tickled the adventure in a number of viewers tonight. So, yeah, uh, thank you. I would say it's much easier for me to understand how Jake Beatty came up with the idea for the race to Alaska after hearing this last 40 minutes. So yes, right. That's it's right. relatively safe when you think about it, right? The, yeah. the death march, the, the 
expedition. Yes, it all makes sense now. I mean, I think I'd be I'd be remiss in not saying that this was a trip that was not sanctioned in any way related to the Northwest Maritime Center, nor does it reflect the quality mm -hmm. education we're <laughs> seeing represent. And I'm complaining about mandatory boater education for kayakers, Mark. And I know. I know. I did a full circle there. That's what I did there. Well, you I want did. to thank everyone for joining. If I if we whet your appetite for Jake's stories there, he'll be joining me on Seattle Boat Show TV during the SeattleBoatShow.com uh, experience. Uh, Margaret Pomerant, famous Margaret. You know her well, Mark. She My had some kind words for her. Alaska flotillas, you bet. Yeah, she <laughs> said she, she's so proud that Seattle is taking the lead and offering a high-quality virtual boat show, which I would say Jake uh, led the way as well with the Wooden Boat Festival. After all, if Seattle can't lead this innovation, what maritime town could? Yay us. So that was nice of Margaret to say that. Um, this was episode 32 uh, in the Saturday Night Live lore. This would have been the Paul, si the famous Paul Simon episode where he wore the turkey outfit. Yes. You see that every <laughs> Thanksgiving one. And uh, the musical guest was George Harrison. Wow. And they sang Homeward Bound. And I found that on the YouTube. I put the, I'll put that in the chat for everybody. But yeah, they, they ended this show uh, playing, um, let's gonna figure this out, a duet with Homeward Bound, which I did not know that existed. So there you go. Well, I'm going to put in a little promo for next week's show. We're going to be uh, doing Seattle Boat Show Live as part of Seattle Boat Show Connect next Thursday night between 7 and 8. We may go a little longer. We've got a special guest. Uh, it won't be Paul Simon, but it'll be <laughs> Sam Devlin, the uh, uh, legendary boat designer from Olympia who has designed and built a number of boats. Jake knows him well from the Wooden Boat Festival and stitch and glue boats and uh, Sam is always uh, a lot of fun and uh, Sam was the first person who led me up the inside passage to Alaska so uh, I'm now up to about 10 or 12 of these trips uh, thanks to Sam and I'm looking forward to having him on we have a, a great deal of fun uh, Sam's also got his share of stories not quite as adventurous as Jake but uh, but quite a few of them so uh, join us next Thursday night or join constantly through the boat show when Peter has a live stream that will go on for the complete uh, duration of the boat show. Lots of interesting guests. And we look forward to seeing you in a week. Well said. I'm gonna leave, we're going to leave it there. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Jake. Happy birthday, Lorena. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I'll see you see next week all. Good night. Good night. <laughs>